It's a commune place and there's a lot of them in the family, not like a normal family. There's about, I don't know how many there's, whatever they get, you know, they share, they share everything. Well, they don't have cars, they have a horse and cart and, you know, they go around on that. Instead of having to worry about fuel and all that, they don't need any fuel. Some people say, you know, they lie about, you know, they, they think they come up here in, in town and that, and some people just don't want to know them. Uh, they're different from other people, they're more friendlier, and if you go up to the street, they always talk to you and all that. And if you go around there, everyone will stop and talk. For five years, this old Norfolk farmhouse has been home to a group of young people. Instead of living like most of us do, they've chosen to live and work together, to share their house and their possessions. They call themselves the Shrub family, a different sort of family, a commune. Sylvia joined a year ago, bringing her two young boys and 14-year-old daughter, Sarah. The point of a commune is that everybody shares things, that they're together all the time and that the people who live here want to be with each other. If you're living in a family where there's just mother and father and your brothers and sisters, the same sort of things are happening all the time together, but living here they're different because each person is different and they're not related at all, apart from me and my mother and my brothers, things like that. But it's affecting all of us. I mean, we're all sort of beginning to lead a completely new life because there are so many other people around. There are nine adults and five children. The children's mothers brought them here when their marriages didn't work out. Here, they're finding that life can be happier, as Sarah's mother, Sylvia, explains. Um, living here, you, you aren't <coughs> ever lonely. There are people all around you, and you can talk to any of them at any moment, really. And you don't... You, you are never isolated from other people in the way that you are if your wife whose husband is out to work all day long. Well, we share work on the house. We all work together on, on sort of repairing the house and getting that to look better and decorating the rooms and things like that. And, and we share things like electricity bills, of course, and the cooking and the washing machine. And uh, those things make it much easier for us to live like this than, than it was when I lived on my own. I find life much more expensive than I find it here. It's incredibly cheap here. In the mornings, people get up at different times, depending on what they're going to do that day. But even with only half the family, the kitchen can get pretty crowded at breakfast time. The children are always up early. But if mother wants a lion for a change, there's always someone around to look after them. When we were filming, two of the girls were giving this way of life a trial. Sue is from a nearby village, and Mona comes from London. She and Sue will soon be making up their minds where the commune life suits them. There's always something that needs doing in and around the house. Well, make the gap. You're all right. It means work, hard physical work, especially when they prefer to do things for themselves and not rely on other people. But not all the hard work is left to the men. Because this is a commune, we share our tasks, and that's why the men put the children to bed sometimes and the women do things like cutting wood. When a girl does the same work as a man, it brings you close together because you know, you know what it's like to do the things that they've done. And when they come home and they say, we were rendering a wall or something, then you know what they're talking about and you know what it's like to do it as well. And the opposite is true. Jobs normally left for women are done by men. Daniel, you want yours on both sides, right? No, on one side. Just on one side. When you cook here, you don't just cook. You have to get the kids up for breakfast and you... Um, make sure they're off to school on time. You cook for the kids in the evening, then you cook for the adults. 
and you get a real insight into what the, the female role is. And you appreciate, you know, what it's like to be with kids day in, day out. And you realise how good it is for the, for the women to be able to get away from it every once in a while because they appreciate the children more. Do you want another piece of bread? No? No? Yes. Well, I think a lot of men in, in, in ordinary families just don't realise. You know, they come home after a day at work and they expect the food to be on the table and everything like that. And, and this woman's had all these kids all day, you know, screaming at her and, and running about and... You know, I, I mean, I think the role of, of women in, in society as it is today is really hard, you know. They try and live as much as possible from what they can grow in their garden. The things they can't grow there, they can buy in bulk because they're a large family. That way, they save a lot of money. Nowadays, most of us never bother to learn how to make our own bread. <laughs> the Shrub family discovered that it can be a lot of fun. Give him another button and some arms Perhaps it's a good thing for young boys to see household jobs being done by men instead of only by women. For children, a place like this is an adventure playground, especially with so many animals around. The two goats provide the shrubs with some of the milk they need. But living off nature isn't all take and no give. Instead of wasting their rubbish, they turn as much of it as possible into food for the soil and for the animals. Sarah goes to the local secondary school, but this week it's half term. What do her friends think about her way of life? I think a lot of my friends were suspicious about coming and say they'd heard a lot from what their parents had said and, and what society as a whole thinks about communes, that it's a, it's a lot of dropouts who, who don't go to work and live off the state. And they just don't, and like, people don't like that. Um, like when people do get to know us, they find that we're normal. I mean, not, not from a zoo or something, or a circus. We're like we're just human beings. Apart from the everyday jobs, they all follow their own interests. Richard, who used to be an apprentice in a factory, discovered that working for himself, restoring old carts, was much better. I work on horse-drawn vehicles because it's, it's the sort of work that I love. I don't know why I've been drawn to it. I guess one of the reasons is because it, it's a trade that's starting to die out. You know, it's a skill I don't want to see lost, but, you know, unless someone does something about it, it will be. I don't think anyone here really likes to work for a boss because it somehow restricts your freedom, you know. It's nice to be able to do what you want to do. Yeah, I think I'll do that, Nick. In their workshop, Steve and Kevin have been making window frames for a neighbour who is restoring an old cottage. Come on, boys! Come on, you To earn their money, they do a variety of odd jobs. Helping farmers with harvesting, cleaning and serving in the local pub, odd bits of building work in the village. They've all had to learn these skills as they've gone along. Steve was a university student, all set for a job in business. Now he gets more fun out of the simple life, working with his hands. Sharing work in general, that's what brought me here and that's, you know, that's why I stayed here. 
because we were working together. And I, I really liked the idea of working together and all going out to work or doing one particular job. The cook of the day has to remain at home. But because everyone takes their turn, they only have to cook once every nine days. Pete wouldn't mind doing it more often because, as chief gardener, it's his own produce that he's preparing. Well, starting things off in, in the greenhouse down there and planting out the seedlings, uh, getting frustrated when they get lost amongst the weeds, but eventually putting a huge pumpkin on the table and eating that for three, maybe four meals, you know, as a sweet, uh, as a savoury, uh, as a main course even, in a soup, anything, you know, it's incredible to be able to do something like that. For putting in those windows, Kevin's been paid five pounds, but he doesn't keep any of it for himself. Well, we, all the money that comes in goes into a communal pool. And so when I go to work, I'm not earning that money for me working because I like working. And the money goes into the communal pool to buy food and pay the bills. It costs the shrubs about £40 a week to live. That's cheap for 14 people, partly because they're just not interested in forever buying new things. Owning more and more things does not make people any happier. They think it will, and when they own one thing that they've wanted, then they don't really feel any better. So then they think, well, if only I had something else, then I would really feel happier, and so they try and get it. But once you realise that you just go on and on like that, and it doesn't really change your basic contentment at all, that then you just look at life in rather a different way and and you realize that happiness is not in what you're owning at all it's in your in yourself the good thing about buying second-hand things or, or things from jumble sales is that you're recycling and you know they're not getting thrown away and wasted and i think there's you know too much of this in this day and age you know people are buying things and then they'll throw them away after you know a year or six months they don't like them and they throw them out and uh, it's, it's just silly, you know, to waste things like that. Although they live life differently from the community, they don't cut themselves off from it. Pete and Richard are in the local dramatic society. At the risk of a spoiled dinner, they manage a quick rehearsal. And I'm going to introduce you to a very nice young man, Commander Challoner. Geoffrey Challoner, is he here? Oh, you know him? I used to. Please allow me to introduce you to no, Hello. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Oh, dear chap. I've seen her. Who? Is it my wife. My wife. And I got, I've got the princess with me. <laughs> Everybody takes a hand in putting the kids to bed. Having a lot of adults around doesn't seem to worry them. In fact, they seem to like it. You sit down there. But does that mean they forget who their real parent is? I think there will always be a special bond with my own children. I do do other things with the other children and I look after them when Sylvia's away or Mona's away. But your children are your own and um, they'll always come running to you if you're there, if something happens to them. Hey, come on, don't fight, please. Mom, I've got to have it for a minute. Okay? This is a s Matthew, come on. I wish I knew how to fly. The children all share the same bedroom, but the adults and Sarah all have their own separate rooms. The evening meal starts with a period of silence when they link hands. When I come back from school and it's been full up of, of teachers and books and all the rest of the hassles of school life and then coming back on a crowded train full of screaming children. You come back and instead of going on to the meal with that still, still going through you, you can just sit down and be with everybody else who, you, who, you, who I've missed during the rest of the day. And it gets me in harmony with them. Because they've been working alone or in groups all day, they try and make this the time when they all meet together. Compared to an ordinary, small family, what do they learn from living in a commune? Living with a group of people, you've got
got more people around you, and so I think you learn more about yourself if there's only one other person there. Um, you